So my wife and I are entering into a new stage in life where our children are kind of grown and they've developed their own social lives and social calendars. And sometimes I think their social life is even more crowded, more busy than our own. And sometimes it's difficult as a parent to kind of wait to be able to have that moment or those times that are becoming fewer and further between where we can spend some one-on-one -on -one time with our children. We're just waiting for an opportunity to spend a few moments with them. And as I've come into this new stage of life, it's caused me to really consider uh, how my relationship with the Lord looks. Because I think sometimes I can become so overwhelmed and so consumed with pursuing the things of the world that maybe the Lord wonders, hey, where's my time? Have you forgotten to come and to spend some time with me? Where is your heart? What is really truly captivating your heart? And that's really what I want to speak about in today's weekly word or in this week's weekly word. See, Jesus really, in, in Matthew chapter 6, he says this. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so often this verse is really preached for people who are wondering about what it looks like to really give generously or to tithe generously. And I think that really that's a part of what this verse is speaking of, but it misses the point because the point that Jesus is making is who holds your heart. See, the Lord knows that where our treasure is, our heart will follow. Where we're spending our time in pursuits of worldly things, those are the things that captivate or hold our hearts. What really holds my checkbook is what holds my heart. My checkbook will become a reflection of my heart. My worldly possessions, my worldly goods is a reflection of where my worship is at. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, uh, where our, our heart should actually be, what should really truly hold our hearts and hold the attention of our hearts, which really that's what the word worship means. It means to give attention over to something. What should really hold our attention really is the Lord, and it isn't really the Lord anymore. Uh, the Lord wants us to kind of bring those things back into focus and to reprioritize our worship and the way that we come into His presence, the amount of time that we spend with Him. The Lord doesn't want your money. The Lord wants to hold your heart. He knows that where your treasure is, your heart will be. So if you're storing things up in the kingdom's perspective, if you're investing in his work, if you're investing in the work of the kingdom, if you're investing in the furtherance of the gospel, then he knows he's got your heart. You see, that's what God is after. He's after your heart. So what does your pursuit in this life really truly represent for your heart, right? What really does it communicate about your relationship with the Lord? This is what, what, what the book of Ephesians says. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, he says, do not be drunk with wine for its debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. The word drunk there means to be intoxicated with. Don't become intoxicated with, with, with wine. Don't be drunk with wine. The Lord could have easily have said any other word there. Don't be intoxicated with your pursuit of career. Don't be intoxicated with your pursuit of relationships, worldly relationships. Don't be intoxicated with your pursuit of money or with your pursuit of education or with your pursuit of retirement or whatever the thing might be that you're struggling with that is captivating your heart, that is intoxicating you and pulling you away from the presence of the Lord. Here, Paul says, don't be intoxicated with those things because they're never going to fill you. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. This is why Jesus, when he is, is there and, and the, the temple is at the temple and the people are worshiping and they're coming on the last day of the feast and they're bringing out these basins and they're emptying these basins every day for seven days. And on the eighth day, they turn over empty basins. There's nothing there. It was a, it was a sign that the people to the people that, hey, the water that sustained in the wilderness really is only speaking of the spirit. Only the spirit can quench your thirst. And it's in the midst of this scene that Jesus steps forth and he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of water, living water. If you want to be satisfied with water, if you want to quench the thirst of your spirit, the Lord knows, Jesus knows that that can only happen when you allow the spirit to flood and to fill your heart. When the people were following Jesus and they're excited about the miracles that he's presenting and they, they, they draw a correlation between Moses and Jesus and they say, hey, Moses, when he led our fathers in the wilderness, he provided manna every morning for them. Maybe you can give us some of that manna, then we'll believe in you. And Jesus says, you've missed the whole point of this whole thing. Besides the fact that it wasn't Moses that provided the manna, it was the Father in heaven that provided the manna, you've you missed the whole thing. And he says this to those who are asking for this sign, begging for this miraculous bread. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. 
Jesus understands that the only way that you will be filled, the only thing that really is worthy of captivating your heart, the only thing that is worthy of becoming intoxicated by in this world is himself. He is the living water, and if you'll drink from his well, you'll never thirst. He is the bread of life, and if you'll break a piece of bread off, and if you'll eat of that bread, you'll never hunger. And if that sounds attractive to you, Jesus' invitation to you today is to come. Come and drink of the living water. Come and partake of the bread of life. He wants this for you. He knows that you will never be filled or intoxicated by chasing the things of this world. That will never do what you need, and what you've needed all along is more of himself. This is why he wants to hold your heart. He knows if you're chasing things out in this world, you'll never be satisfied. You'll only be disappointed. If you just can cut out some of the middlemen, if you'll just maybe just take the Lord at his word and just say, you know what? I believe your word and what it says. I believe that you know better than I do. And I'm going to stop chasing after these things that I think are going to fulfill my desires, that are going to give me some sort of purpose or some sort of meaning in life. I'm going to stop all of those pursuits and I'm just going to do what your word says. I'm going to trust that you are the one who fills my aching soul. You're the one who can lift my spirit. You're the one who can satisfy my hunger. You're the one who can quench my thirst. If you will just believe the Lord for that today, he will meet you in that place. It's amazing because Jesus, when he was explaining what the kingdom of heaven is like, he uses this one parable that really kind of sticks out to me. And he says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that has been hidden in a field, which a man found and he covered it up. And then for joy, he goes and he sells everything that he has and he goes and he buys that field. You know what the kingdom of heaven is like, Jesus says? It's like a man who gave up everything to buy a precious treasure that he wanted more than anything. And in this text, really what Jesus is speaking of, he is that man who sold everything. He gave his life. He came, was born into humanity, suffered and bled and died, went to a cross and rose from the dead, claiming victory over sin, death, and the grave. Right? He did all of that so that he could purchase you and me, the treasure that was hidden in the field. You are his treasure. And I wonder if the, if the Lord could say the same of you. Would he be able to look at you by your pursuits, by your desires, by what captivates and intoxicates your life, would he look at you and say that he would believe that he is your treasure? I know I'm the treasure of the Lord, and with my life, the way I live my life, I want the Lord to look at my life and say, I know and I see that I am your treasure. I want to be the man in that parable as much as Jesus was where it says, I'm willing to give everything to sell it all, to go and to follow Jesus. Will you enter into that kind of relationship with him today? You see, Jesus gave everything to purchase you from the clutches of death. You are his treasure. Is he your treasure today?